Caleb Benjamin, intern at Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for October 14th, 2023. Last weekend, the world watched as Hamas attacked Israel, reportedly killing over 1,200 Israelis. Now, attention is turning to Israel's response. Israeli strikes in Gaza this week have reportedly killed over 1,500 Palestinians. For today's Archive episode, I picked an episode from May 8th, 2012, in which Benjamin Wittes sat down with Peter Berkowitz to discuss his book, Israel and the Struggle Over the International Laws of War. The book is an impassioned critique of the abuse of the laws of war by Israel's critics in both international organizations and in the academy. Hello, and welcome to the Lawfare Podcast. I'm Benjamin Wittes. Our subject today is Israel and the International Laws of War. We're talking about a new book by Peter Berkowitz entitled, appropriately enough, Israel and the Struggle Over the International Laws of War, just published by the Hoover Institution Press. Peter is the chair of the Hoover Institution's Coret Tobi Task Force on National Security and the Law, of which I and several other members of the Lawfare blog are members. The book, which is fewer than a hundred pages long and very readable in a sitting, is an impassioned critique of the abuse of the laws of war by critics of Israel in the UN and in the academy, and an argument in Peter's words, quote, that in our age, the struggle over the international laws of war has become critical to the defense of liberal democracies in a dangerous world. Peter stopped by Brookings yesterday to talk about the book. So Peter, what's the book about? <laughs> So uh, my book is on the struggle over the international laws of war. It's uh, really about two cases of uh, lawfare, which I imagine the listeners of this pod- podcast know is the use of law as a, uh, as a political weapon. And I focus on two cases. One is uh, uh, the Goldstone Report, which was published by the United Nations General Assembly in September 2009, and the Gaza fl- flotilla controversy, which erupted in May 2010. And what's the uh, what what's the unifying feature of those two episodes? Well, to describe the unifying feature, let me just go back a little bit and tell you that the the book grew out of really um, an event and an observation. And the the event was September 11th attacks uh, on the United States by Al Qaeda, which focused my interest on questions of national security and law. Uh, and the second was an observation of which the book grew out of. And this is an observation that goes back uh, actually to the 1830s. And Tocqueville, who said about the United States back in the 1830s that uh, in the United States, in this young democracy, important political questions are increasingly turned into legal questions. And it seemed to me, especially as I began to look at the matter after September 11th, that important questions of diplomacy and nas- uh, national security were increasingly turned into legal questions. So uh, with, uh, with that in mind, I had also become interested in Israel, and I came to see Israel as a kind of front line of a battle that the United States is very much engaged in, a, a struggle, and the struggle is a struggle over uh, the meaning and the interpretation of the international laws of war. That's the guiding theme the meaning, struggle for interpret to interpret authoritatively the international laws of war. And so these two events uh, take place in relatively rapid succession. Um, For those of the readers, uh, listeners who, for whom they are not at the tips of their consciousness, um, just give us the, the basic factual background regarding what happened in both cases. Sure. So uh, start with the Goldstone Report. The Goldstone Report was a report commissioned by uh, uh, the UN General Assembly's Human Rights Council to investigate allegations of war crimes against Israel during Israel's Miftzalfer uh, Yitzhukah Operation Cast Lead. Operation Cast Lead was conducted by Israel from mid-December 2008 to uh, uh, Janu- middle of January 2009. And the purpose of uh, Operation Cast Lead, the Gaza operation, was to bring to an end, or at least substantially reduce, the firing of mortar mortar shells, rockets, and missiles at civilian populations in uh, southern southern Israel. These were fired uh, by uh, by Hamas and Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip, and uh, these. 
uh, re these rockets and missiles have been raining down on uh, Israeli civilian population for about uh, eight years, intensified after 2007 when Hamas took, took complete control of the Gaza Strip. So uh, while, the, uh, while the fighting was still going on, uh, the Human Rights Council uh, announced that uh, it was going to send a fact-finding mission to investigate these allegations of war crimes. There were, there were problems with that, but eventually by April 2009, uh, a mission with Justice Richard Goldstone at the head was, uh, was authorized to uh, produce a UN General Assembly report on these allegations of war crimes. Uh, Goldstone insisted that the report would investigate accusations both against Israel and against uh, Hamas. But it turns out when the report was published, 545-page report was published in mid-September 2009, the report overwhelmingly focused on allegations that Israel during this three-week operation had committed war crimes and crimes against humanity. Indeed, uh, the most dramatic, in, in my judgment, scandalous claim, legal finding, I should say, in the report, was that Israel had undertaken, uh, I'm closely paraphrasing the, uh, the language of the report, that Israel had undertaken a deliberately disproportionate attack that was designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize the civilian population of uh, Gaza. So that report was published in September 2009, and very quickly became uh, uh, an authoritative document for, for condemning Israel as a, uh, as a terrorist nation. Now, uh, that's September 2009. Israel had tightened a block, during the Gaza operation, Israel had tightened the blockade that it had imposed upon Gaza uh, after Hamas uh, came to power. Um, in May 2010, uh, a, um, a flotilla of six ships left, uh, I believe, left a port in Turkey to uh, ostensibly, well, not even ostensibly, some people said to bring humanitarian cargo to, uh, uh, to the Palestinian civilian population in Gaza Strip. Um, in fact, one of, the, one of the organizers said, uh, one of the organizers of the flotilla pronounced before the flotilla said sail that the, the real purpose of the, uh, of the flotilla was to break the blockade. In any case, uh, in late May, Israel successfully stopped uh, five of the six ships in the flotilla from breaking its blo blockade. Uh, the, uh, in stopping the sixth ship, the Mavi Marmara, Israel uh, was forced to uh, board at night, met violent resistance. The Israeli commandos uh, um, dealt with the resistance. In the course of, uh, uh, in the course of taking over the ship, uh, nine, nine of the passengers who had been attacking the Israeli commandos were killed. Several were injured. Uh, immediately after, uh, after, uh, after that incident, uh, Israel was accused of uh, acting unlawfully, and acting unlawfully because it was said its blockade was illegal, and, uh, uh, and therefore Israel was not entitled to stop these, uh, these ships at, at sea. So in the space of... Uh, Less than a year, Israel was forced to deal with two sets of accusations, one from the Goldstone Report, which alleged that its operation in Gaza was essentially disproportionate, and second, arising out of the Gaza flotilla controversy, that its blockade on Gaza was uh, illegal, and therefore it's uh, using physical force, military force, to stop the Mavi Mamar and the other ships, was also illegal under international law. Now, you, I think... It's fair to summarize your book as having two broad theses. One is that um, both of these claims were um, legally not just untenable, but bordering on absurd, per per real perversions of settled understandings of international law, both substantively and procedurally. And secondly, that we should care um, as Americans. Yes. Um, now, I, I think the first, I, I, I want to return to the first one in a minute, but let's start with the second one, because I actually think a lot of the listeners at this point are probably thinking to themselves, 
that's very interesting, but why should I care? Yes. And I, and I guess, so let's start with that. Uh, what's, the, what's the answer to the so what question? The, the Israel engaged in some armed action. The world ganged up on Israel. It cited international law. Let's hypothesize capriciously and, and unfairly. So what? Yes. Fair enough. So, uh, so the first reason the United States might care is because uh, uh, Israel is a liberal democracy in the Middle East, and it was uh, the international laws of war being uh, abused to, uh, to uh, in effect, criminalize Israel's inherent right of self-defense. And that's an injustice, and the United States should be against uh, uh, injustice. But that won't be very satisfying because there are many injustices in the world, and uh, the United States must establish priorities. So uh, I think uh, a more uh, another reason that the United States should care is, as I, uh, as I alluded to very briefly at the beginning, Israel is on the front lines of a battle that the United States, too, is, is engaged in. That is, the United States, too, is facing uh, transnational terrorism, Islamic-inspired terrorism. Uh, and, uh, and in this battle, there is an effort to increasingly uh, diminish the scope of, of, I use the language of the UN Charter Article 51, to diminish the scope of states' inherent right of self-defense. So the bad, uh, defective, sometimes pathetically defective arguments used against Israel, which nevertheless uh, garner a great deal of support in the international community, uh, will come back to if they are not already being directed at the United States. Now, people might object, yes, but um, Israel is a, uh, is a small country surrounded by enemies without many friends in the United Nations General Assembly. The United States, uh, some say maybe it's on the decline, but it's still the world's sole superpower. The United States can swat away the kinds of concerns w which um, the kinds of uses of uh, war as a weapon that, uh, that Israel must uh, fear. I don't think that's quite right, and for this reason. Many of the arguments that, <coughs> excuse me, that have been directed against Israel uh, are, have been generated from within or embraced by um, the American Legal Academy. These arguments have a great deal of purchase here in the United States. And so we are, uh, we are, we have educated. We continue to uh, educate law students who are, um, who embrace, I think, some of these bad arguments that work, in my judgment, both um, illegitimately in the sense of contrary to international laws written, and unwisely in the sense of imprudently for liberal democracies. These uh, these bad laws work to. Uh, illegitimately circumscribe the le legitimate use of force by liberal democracies. All right, so talk about the Goldstone Report. Um, it made for unpleasant reading for those who supported the Gaza operation. Um, but that's not your complaint about it. Your complaint about it as I read it, is that, first of all, it should never have been conducted in the first place. And second of all, having been conducted, it should have endeavored to um, make factual conclusions that were sound and analytical conclusions that were defensible. So walk us through it. What were the problems? Okay, so, so, several problems, which you, which you have nicely set up. Um, let's begin with the simplest uh, first. Um, one, the, the manner in which it collected facts. It, uh, it very heavily, the Goldstone Report, very heavily re re relied upon testimony from Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip, uh, all of whom it regarded as credible, reliable witnesses. Uh, the problem here is uh, twofold. One is that these are all civilians living under uh, a violent authorita authoritarian government where dissent is not permitted. It's hard to understand how the testimony can 
be treated as credible and reliable. Second, in gathering the facts, um, the Goldstone Report uh, did not gather facts in Israel. It's true that the reason for that is the Israeli government refused to cooperate with the Goldstone Report, but the Israeli government was under no legal obligation to, uh, to cooperate with the Goldstone Report. Second, uh, the Goldstone Report, so the problem with factual findings, flawed. Uh, second, the Goldstone Report, uh, in my judgment, misapplied the relevant legal tests. Um, the two master concepts of law here, relevant to Israel's conduct of, uh, of the Gaza operation, the law of uh, the principle of distinction, the principle of proportionality. The principle of distinction requires fighters to distinguish themselves from, uh, from civilians and to uh, uh, distinguish themselves from civilians and distinguish military objects from civilians and civilian targets. Uh, the principle of proportionality says that fighters must refrain from attacks, even on legitimate, uh, legitimate military objectives, if those attacks are likely to cause uh, uh, harm that's excessive in view of uh, military advantage gain. So what's the problem here? The problem for the Goldstone Report is in both cases, the principle of distinction, the principle of proportionality, those two principles give rise to legal tests which are reasonable tests. Reasonable te reasonableness tests. That is, uh, the test for distinction requires uh, requires the uh, the judge to ask, what would a reasonable soldier or a reasonable commander have done in the circumstances? In what what kind of ammunition would he have used? What kind of targeting decision would he have made? Was it reasonable for him to think that that shadowy figure? or that building was a legitimate military objective. Similarly, with the, the closely related test of proportionality, was it reasonable for a, uh, a soldier or commander in that circumstance to, you, to uh, think that this kind of attack would not produce uh, harm or damage that was excessive? And obviously, or I think it should be obvious, excessive is an extremely context-sensitive notion. Now, since uh, Judge Goldstone and his, and his uh, mission members had no knowledge of the Israeli rules of engagement and didn't interview Israeli uh, soldiers or commanders, they were in no position to apply a reasonable test either in regard to the principle of distinction or the principle of proportionality. So it seemed to me that uh, their legal findings, and the report is rife with legal findings, even though it's supposed to be a fact-finding mission, is right with legal findings, seems to me were inherently invalid. Now, Justice Goldstone retracted some significant portion of the report. How much of his retraction is responsive to the criticisms that you've made? Not, not directly responding to you, that yes. is, but, yes. but, but, but is he acknowledging it in, the, in, in retracting portions of the report or, or more than portions of the report, is he acknowledging the errors that you're claiming, or is or is this on on, on some different basis? Yeah, yes and no. So uh, on April first, two thousand and eleven, uh, Justice Goldstone published a uh, an op-ed in the Washington Post, in which he uh, he, he retracted uh, the most egregious accusation against Israel. Namely, he said, uh, if I had known then, when he published the report, what I know now, I would not have asserted that Israel's, uh, uh, that Israel's intention was to uh, undertake a deliberately disproportionate attack designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize. In other words, uh, the most serious claim that Israel's operation was inherently terrorist operation was retracted by Justice Goldstone. However, in my view, quite misleadingly, he claimed that he needed to retract that on the basis of information that had come to light through his investigations and Israeli investigations over the previous uh, couple of years. In my view, he never had adequate information to, to reach the damning conclusion that Israel's military operation had been inherently, deliberately a terrorist uh, operation. Now, your, your argument... There's an even an antecedent argument to that, which is that 
his appointment was not lawful, and that there was a sort of perversion of the uh, of the laws of war and the in, the structure of investigations of the law of war in his mere appointment and and the request on the part of the Human Rights Council of him to do this. Um, Yes, that's right. Uh, and let me explain because I, I think this um, this argument. Uh, thank you for uh, emphasizing is is important and has been uh, neglected. So there are two uh, two ways of getting at this problem. Uh, um, I'll take the less powerful first. That is that uh, under the uh, the legal framework created by the. Uh, the United Nations Charter and the Geneva Conventions, the system of the international of international law, the international laws of war, uh, if responsibility for collective security is assigned to the Security Council, not to the General Assembly. And according to Article 12 of the UN Charter, if the if the uh, Security Council becomes seized of a matter, the General Assembly should not get involved. It should at least not make recommendations, take actions. In fact, uh, the General Assembly, after sorry, after the uh, Security Council seized itself of the Gaza conflict in early January 2009, uh, the, the General Assembly proceeded to get involved, and its creature, an organ of the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council, uh, immediately, mid-January, uh, announced that it was going to conduct an investigation um, before the guns fell silent. Uh, This was overstepping overstepping its boundaries. It had no right to be involved in security matters while the UN Security Council was seized of the matter. And the UN Security Council never ceased to be seized of the matter. There are niceties here, but but, but let me go on to what I think is, uh, is the much more important point. Uh, concerning the lack of proper legal foundations for the for the Gaza inquiry, um, under a multiple sources of international law, uh, UN Security Council Charter, uh, sorry, UN Charter, Article Two, Section Seven, uh, uh, Article One Forty Six of the Geneva Conventions, the Rome Statute. Um, it falls to nation states in the first place when they are accused of war crimes uh, to undertake investigations. And according to these multiple sources of international law, it's only when a nation state has shown itself unwilling or unable to undertake investigations that international bodies are authorized to get involved. What are some examples? The primary examples are uh, genocide in Rwanda in uh, uh, genocide in Rwanda and uh, outbreak of civil and ethnic war in uh, the former Yugoslavia, both in the mid-1990s. These were both cases where it was clear there were no courts available to undertake investigations. And indeed, uh, Judge Richard Goldstone was uh, was named prosecutor for the tribunals for both Rwanda and uh, the former Yugoslavia. Uh, that was not the situation in Israel in January 2009. Israel has a legal system which is, uh, I would say, a, uh, at least the peer of, uh, of legal systems uh, such as that of the United States, Canada, uh, Australia, Australia. There was no evidence that Israel was unable or unwilling to conduct investigations into accusations that there had been uh, violations of war crimes during the Gaza operation. And indeed, Israel was had undertaken, had begun investigations in April 2009, when uh, when Justice Goldstone's mission was uh, f- was uh, finally authorized by the Human Rights Council. So, uh, so g- given all that, it seems it seems to me that the Goldstone mission clearly interfered with Israel's right and its responsibility under the international laws of war to conduct these uh, investigations. So let's turn to the Mavi Mar- Marmara, the um, big outcry. Um, it is all predicated on the illegality of the blockade and therefore the right to break the blockade. Um, 
And you argue that it's something this side of frivolous, or, or maybe the <laughs> cro- over the line into frivolous. Um, so we'll make your case. I'll make my case. Uh, so the, the, um, the argument against Israel is that Israel is not entitled to uh, impose a blockade on the Gaza Strip because Israel is the occupying power Gaza Strip, and as the occupying power, Israel is not permitted under the international laws of war to um, undertake acts of war against uh, an area of people that it uh, that it occupies. Um, and, and the argument is that Israel exercises, uh, and here's a term of art, effective control over the Gaza Strip, therefore it's occupying power. Why do I think this is... Um, near the line on one side or the other of uh, frivolous because uh, here's how effective control the standard for determining whether a territory is occupied is defined under the international laws of war there are two elements determine whether one power exercises effective control one element is that the, uh, the occupying power must have boots on the ground in the territory the other element is that the occupying power must be exercising um, the functions of government. Now, uh, after 2005, with its evacuation from the Gaza Strip in 2005, Israel ceased to have any soldiers and any citizens in the Gaza Strip, with the, with the one exception of, uh, of Gilad Shalit, a soldier who was being held uh, unlawfully by, uh, by Hamas for, I think, five years. Uh, overlapping in this period. So uh, um, Israel didn't meet the first prong of the test. No citizens, uh, no soldiers there. The second prong of the test is exercising the functions of government. But of course, Israel wasn't exercising functions of government. Fatah had mainly been exercising the functions of government up until 2006. It lost elections to uh, Hamas in January 2006 and in June 2007, Hamas took over from the Palestinian Authority. Now, the critics will say, yes, but Israel still controls borders, Israel still controls airspace, Israel controls the flow of humanitarian goods uh, in and out. With the, with the blo- sea blockade, Israel exercises even more control. And that's right. Israel does affect, does exercise significant control. But it, what it does not exercise the two forms of control that uh, the international laws of war define, uh, state, define occupation. But I want to add this. Let's say Israel did occupy the Gaza Strip. Israel still retains its inherent right of self-defense under Article 51. And in those situations, if Hamas were uh, engaged in arms attack on Israel, Israel would have a right under the international laws of war to defend itself and do what's necessary to bring those armed attacks to an end. Uh, To my mind, um, uh, roughly 12,000 mortar shells, rockets, and missiles over a period of 12 years significantly intensified, as I said, after 2000 when Hamas came to power, uh, put Israel in a state of armed conflict with, uh, with Hamas, and Israel was, uh, had a right uh, under the international laws of war to do what was necessary to bring those rocket, missile, uh, and mortar shell attacks to an end. And, and keep in mind this. What would Israel's alternative have been if not a, block, a blockade? By the way, a blockade that allowed in humanitarian goods. The only alternative for bringing those uh, attacks to, to an end would have been a, um, a ground operation in Gaza that would have made the December 2008, January 2009 ground operation look like child's play. So I want to come back before we close to the question of why anyone should care. Um, I, you know, y- y- you describe um, a series of attenuated, somewhere between attenuated and frivolous legal arguments being mustered and carrying the day in international tribunals and in international public opinion. 
and none of them caused Israel to behave differently than it thought was consistent with its internet right of inherent right of self defense. Um, and none of them would be too surprising to those who have a, you know, even a sort of rudimentary understanding of the lack of warmth in Israeli UN relationship over the years. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in what's different about these two episodes, why they in individually and collectively um, cause you to say, this has gone too far, I need to sit down and write, you know, a, 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 a quite impassioned book about sort of drawing a line in the sand around uh, around the laws of war and protecting the that permissive quality of them that allows states to do what's necessary. Why now? Uh, another excellent question. Thank you. Uh, I think with um, w- with uh, both the Goldstone report and. Uh, and the, the Gaza flotilla controversy, uh, you did see uh, an international reaction of a new dimension. I mean, really, uh, world attention was galvanized around specifically intensely legal claims. And the United States itself, too, has, uh, has been embroiled in issues of national security and law since the September 11th uh, um, attacks. It's not as if there were never any questions about national security and law. But, um, but I do think that uh, what is a kind of uh, post-World War II revolution ha- has intensified after September 11th attacks. My goodness, I, I even know individuals who have more or less changed jobs and made question of national security and law their very professional focus. Um, I can't as, imagine uh, what he's going to be talking about. <laughs> as a result of these uh, developments. And thank God for that, too. Thank God for that, too. So, um, so uh, I think what, what has happened is that uh, taking a somewhat bigger picture for the moment, um, after, uh, especially after World War II, we saw, um, we saw two kinds of revolutions in lawfare. One much talked about has to do with uh, technology, the development with, of weapons of massively more power and amazingly greater um, uh, precision and mobility, even. But there's also been a kind of revolution in law, uh, uh, law and warfare. Law, uh, warfare has become much more judicialized. We've seen a much, much greater role for uh, courts and judges in, uh, in, in war. To the extent that um, you know, there are serious and distinguished uh, professors of uh, national security and law who envisage uh, small groups of four to six soldiers patrolling um, uh, dense de- de- dense cities looking for terrorists with with a lawyer amongst them to give advice on what buildings can be broken into, what caliber ammunition to use. Uh, and so on. And I think all of this, uh, this revolution, revolution in, uh, in the judicialization of war, uh, was uh, especially accelerated as a result of the Sept- September 11th attacks because it shone a light on the issue in a way that it didn't before with uh, Israel. Israel could be attacked in a lot of ways, but now the United States became a, uh, became a focus as well. And so since I guess I, uh, um, uh, I believe that uh, the United States is going to, for a long time, be facing uh, transnational terrorists and uh, a wide range of extremely difficult questions uh, uh, of the sort, Ben, that you know, you've been uh, working so effectively on now for a few years, but I'm afraid it could fill up <laughs> years to come. Uh, I think we need to pay uh, pay the most careful uh, attention to them, and I suspect again that uh, the arguments that are developed have that have been developed uh, to uh, to to shrink, to even criminalize Israel's exercise of its inherent right of defense as a liberal democracy, will um, uh, uh, will be one day 
uh, directed at the United States, and so we need to be protected to meet these arguments, not, not, with, not merely, or I shouldn't say, not with guffaws, not with, uh, not with outrage, but with better legal arguments, and, and maybe should end here. Uh, and that's because uh, I believe that uh, the international laws of war need a defense. I mean, it, it is a uh, irony of the moment that I, I believe study would show. I have not undertaken the empirical study, but I believe study would show that no two armies in the history of warfare have devoted uh, more hours, greater labor to understanding international laws of war and trying to conduct operations in accordance with them than the United States and Israel. And I believe that uh, certainly no two armies in, uh, say, the last half century have been the objects of more opprobrium, I think, for uh, failing to honor the laws of war. So uh, I actually think it's very important to liberal democracies, uh, liberal democracies which are committed to principles of individual freedom, inequality, which respect dignity of the individual, to honor these uh, to honor these commitments to the extent possible in war, to balance the legitimate claims of uh, humanitarian responsibility and military necessity. We in the United States need to learn from uh, uh, the challenges that Israel faces. Thank you very much for coming in, Peter. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Lawfare Podcast a project of the Harvard Law School Brookings Project on Law and Security. Our music was performed by Sophia Yan.